Hey, good morning. There's a picture, a collage of what you guys did last week. Uh, I think well over 200 people got involved in our community. We sent you all out in several projects along with things around here. And man, what a great job last week, loving our neighbor as ourselves. Why don't you give God praise for that and maybe thank all the people that were part of that. A uh, lot to celebrate there. I am so proud of this church, and I love the fact that you live out your faith in this way, and I'm as committed ever, as ever to making sure we observe that every year as a way of just reminding all of us, this is what we do. This is what the church does. This is what faith is about. This is what we do in our community, and you guys lived it out last week. Thank you so, so much. Um, we are moving forward with our study on Revelation. thought I'd tell you a little quick story as we get into Revelation 4. We already read it, but you can... Turn there in your Bibles, grab your Bible if you need one, we got them in the back, grab your phone, whatever device you use um, to study the scriptures with me. Over in Italy, there's a place that was built back in the 400s by one of the emperors as a mausoleum, a, a tomb site for his sister. It's actually not in Rome, where you might think it to be, it's actually in Ravenna, Italy, way up on the north part of Italy. Way back when, when his sister passed away, he wanted to do something to honor her memory. And so what he did was constructed a mausoleum, like a small temple that's designed in a double cross with the tower in the center being like the top of a cross at the time. He, he built this thing and inside is the most luxurious, beautiful, amazingly crafted mosaic in the world. Some would say it's the most impressive mosaic ever created. And if you walk in, you see scenes of the Bible and scenes of Jesus put there by this emperor in honor of his faith-believing sister. One of them, as you walk in the first part of the entrance cross, is the good shepherd with his sheep, and he's leading them along on his way basically to eternity. And what's so amazing about this place is that when you and I were, if we were to go visit there, you'd walk in and because it's so dimly lit from very few window spaces open to see light come through, you'd walk in and you wouldn't even be impressed because you can't see anything. By the time people get in it, it's so dark, you really can't make out what the mosaics are on the ceiling or on the walls until somebody with the proper coin puts a coin into a box and pulls a lever and all of a sudden light comes in to the entire building. Spotlights hit all of the mosaics. You can see for about 10 seconds the beauty of this room. Now you can Google it and get a much better shot, but I share that story with you because of the amazing beauty that is only revealed by a momentary glimpse of light. Today in Revelation, John has a very similar experience. He has been taken from the first vision of Revelation. There's about five of them. You can listen to the uh, in-depth study online this week about the five visions. But he is taken from the first vision where Jesus shows up at the Isle of Patmos, speaks to him about the seven churches that he wants to send a letter to, and he has this amazing vision of this resurrected, ascended Jesus. Today, the scene changes and John is summoned by Jesus up to the temple of God. Incredible passage that Monsi just read to you as part of our worship. It's in Revelation chapter four. It starts with Jesus saying, okay, John, you come up here to me and I wanna reveal to you, show you something that you've never seen before. And John is summoned in through the gate into the temple of God himself. Come on. You should be like, what is he going to see? He went to a place that no man has gone before. Come on, with the Star Trek thing, you didn't get that. Okay. Sorry, didn't get that. He walks through the gate. Listen, the gate that's been shut since Genesis chapter 3. And he sees an immaculate picture. Something so amazing that he struggles to find words 
for humanity to understand what he's seen before his eyes. He beholds the temple of God. What does he see? Well, let me break down chapter four to you in three specific visions that he has as a part of this scene. The first thing he sees is the sanctuary of God himself. In the center of this place is a throne, and on the throne is the presence of a being. He can't even describe what that looks like because the center of the throne and the being on the throne, somebody's on there, is so massive, so big, he can't even see it all with his naked eyes. And you've got to understand that. God is so big that you can't contain him in your vision. In fact, John's going to share with that in different parts of Revelation. He sees the right hand of that being pass out a scroll. That'll be next week. He, he sees God summon something from another portion. He sees a robe that comes down off of this being. He, he recognizes this to be Yahweh, but he can't even fathom or encapsulate how big this person really is. And that's in the center of the throne. And, and then he tries to describe in human terms the things that he sees around the throne. Now, you want to know where we get things from that we use in worship or why we design sanctuaries the way we do or, or what is it, why do we sing so much in church or, or what is it about choir? Do you remember choirs? Do you guys remember choirs? Nowadays we have praise bands. All of that stuff comes from these scenes and instructions of God about worship. And John sees this and the things we've learned to do over the last 2,000 years comes from this particular vision. First of all, he says, I see this center being and lightning and thunder and fire. And all this stuff is coming out from him. Be, meaning that the center of activity of all humanity and of all creation and of all eternity comes from the center of the throne. And then he says, I see, I see these, these amazing pictures of, a, of like jasper and carmelade, this, these two stones. What is he talking about there? Well, what he's saying is, I see the glimmer of light being reflected in what is just incredible beauty in heaven. Jesus, we know, is the center, the light of the world and the light of eternity. And his light is reflecting through these two primary stones. What are these stones? Jasper, Carmelite. Jasper, the first stone in the breastpiece of the high priest, representing one tribe of Israel. And Carmelite, the red stone, that's the last stone in the breastpiece of the high priest, the first stone and the last stone, the alpha and the, help me out everybody, Omega. the genesis and the, the beginning and the end. And heaven reflects this, emanating from the center of this sanctuary. He says not only that, <laughs> He sees this rainbow that circles this being in heaven, a rainbow. Boy, we have just corrupted and torched the representation of what a rainbow truly means in our culture. Because the rainbow, you know where the rainbow story comes from, right? Rainbow story comes from everybody? Noah. Noah. You know that story, Noah, the flood, and then the rainbow is given to him. The rainbow has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with God. It was his promise, his idea, his creation, his offering or blessing to us. When you see a rainbow, it's a reminder that God is always, always faithful to his promises. Always faithful. And so, of course, what would you see in heaven? A rainbow of his faithfulness encircling the throne of his being. See, when you and I see a rainbow, it doesn't represent what we get in life. The rainbow to God represents what he gives in life. And we can corrupt things from heaven all we want, but it will never change his faithfulness. JT was praying in the communion time about a word. to Maybe that's a word to you right now. That God will always be faithful to you. Pain, sorrow, hurt, heartache, struggle, difficulty at work, problems at home. Just remember the rainbow. It encircles him to remind all of us 
and to speak for him that he will always be faithful to you. Then not only that, there's more we could cover in this thing. That he, has, he says there's this sea. What is the sea that he envisions this incredible scene to be? What is that sea? Well, in the Bible, there's three ways the word sea is used symbolically. Number one, it represents separation. A sea would be the thing that separates people and masses of land. It separates, there's a sea between heaven and earth. There's, there's a sea that separates the Canaanites from the Jewish people in the Old Testament before they crossed over the Jordan. There, there was a sea that separates all of Europe from Israel in the Middle East. That, come on, we know that's true too. What separates us from Europe? An ocean. What separates us from the East? An ocean, that, that would be symbolically a demonstration of God saying, I'm separate from all of creation. I'm so different, I'm so holy. But secondly, the way that sea gets represented in the Bible that I feel like, this is my opinion, but my opinion is the sea that John sees is billions and billions of angels and souls. Trillions. Is there a gazillion? I don't even know what a gazillion is. The mass of people would appear like a sea before God. Diana, there's a, there's a picture of Israel's Temple Mount as it exists today somewhere there. There it is. When we were there a couple years uh, last year, we got to actually go on the Temple Mount. That, that is odd and doesn't always happen. We were privileged to be able to go there. And this was a scene that I took a picture of as you enter from the south gates, the south steps up to what would have been the temple. I started weeping, just to, not because of the mosque dome over there. That, doesn't, that wasn't even there 2,000 years. I started weeping, imagining the sea of people before God in worship and imagining entering the gate to his altar and just even the privilege of seeing the worship that would be going on for God, for Yahweh. Just imagine you're in heaven and you enter the gate and you see all of the people, past, present, even future, loved ones you've been missing that have gone before you, faithful people of the scriptures that have led the way for us to have a faith at all. People that we talk about that were part of the story of God, they'd be in that sea, worshiping him. You, you talk, I talk about, hey, when I get to heaven, I'm going to look for this person, this person. No, you're not. You know what you're going to be looking for? The one at the center. That's all you'll be looking for. Just as John, when he walks through this gate, that's the one he sees as well. The sea of people could have been the foundation, this platform or this foundation of heaven itself, and that's a possible explanation as well. Either way, John says the beauty of the scene is beyond words to describe. It reflects the light of God in its beauty and color and majesty better than any mosaic mausoleum in Italy. John goes on to describe that, and I just, I just wanted to pause and show you the centerpiece of what John sees is the altar of God with him sitting on a throne. Do you realize every time you worship, you are entering just like this, you are entering the Temple presence of God. What, what were you thinking about when you came in today? Were you thinking about, I hope the room's comfortable. I hope nobody's sitting in my seat. Man, I wish the band would do this music that I like. I hope the songs they pick are really good ones. I, I'm so grateful they took my kids for an hour so I can have a breather. Come on, that's pretty funny. I hope my spouse hears something that helps. When you enter the temple of God, there's only one thing to be looking for. He's the one in the center. 
He's the one to be worshipped. And can I just pause for any of the others that are watching online or watching the recording? God bless you for doing so, but can I remind you that there's no individual broadcast from heaven for people to watch. You come before the presence of God. That is what the heavenly temple looks like. We will not be sitting in our couches worshiping the Lord of heaven. Come on. We will be standing in his presence. And he will be sitting on a throne. It says that when John sees this picture, he sees one sitting on a throne. John recognizes the one that's sitting to be the king. A king in that day and age would have sat on their throne when they were in a position to listen, to receive, to be praised, to be honored, for everyone else to do the talking. When the king stands, Everybody gets silent and he has something to say. And what he says is the command of the kingdom. That's going to happen here in just a minute. You'll hear about that in the next two weeks. But for right now, the king is sitting waiting for you to praise him. And he waits for you to praise him when you walk in this building. He waits for you to praise him when you open your scriptures every day. He, he waits for you to praise him when you begin your prayers, our Father in heaven. Are you giving your attention to the one in the center of the throne? Then he says, okay, that's the one scene. Then the next thing he notices in a different part of the vision is a choir of these cherubim that are flying around the one on the throne. Cherubim are an interesting description of an angel. Now, it's hard to imagine, let alone describe it to us in human terms, but he does the best he can. Did you realize that God has a choir in heaven? Do you guys remember choirs? That, that group that would be like sitting behind the pastor and sing and, and, and preferably say, amen, pastor, keep preaching it. Well, God has his own choir in heaven. These four angels, four is a magical number in the description of creation and in the description of heaven. Four is the number of structure and organization. When God created the universe, he created it with a north, south, east, and west. Four directions. When he gave instructions for the temple and tabernacle, there were four sides to the structure that he instructed both Moses and eventually Solomon to build. Four is the number you and I use. How many legs are on the chair you're sitting on? Four. Why? Because four legs gives you strength and stability to make sure you stay put and don't fall over in the aisles. God designed this four throughout all kinds of things in Scripture, including the structure of the universe. And here in heaven, we have these four angels flying around. You can study this more later in the advanced notes later that you can pull from our website. But those four represent four types of attributes of God. The, the lion, the king of created animal, the ox, the strongest servant and worker be in the kingdom, the the human that has the mind and the ability to choose and the image of God in placed into humanity and then the eagle that flies above all things and is sovereign as far as the universe creation of animals above all of the other things created. All echoing uniquely the sovereignty and incredible immaculate attribute of God. But here's what's so amazing to me. This is what I want you to get. All four of those cherubim are unique. John describes them as very different, unique types of things. And yet they're in unison when it comes to what they're cr crying out to God. They're in unison as they share what they have to offer to the one that's on the throne. They're crying out together. Here it is. 
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Can I just speak to the American church a little bit? And you're part of that, so am I. We get so enamored with what we have to offer, what we're all about, what gifts we have, what we want to do, what we want out of the church, what we want to do to serve in the kingdom. That is not what these angels are worried about. They're worried about uniting together to bring one worship chorus from all creation to the one who is different and unique and separate and powerful and holy. Do you see that? <laughs> well, they didn't sing the song I wanted to sing, so I'm not singing. They, I want to sing my way, or I want to do things my way. I want to give my gifts my way. I want to do... There is no my in heaven. We all, in unity and humility, cry out, say it with me, Holy, holy, holy. So next time you come to church, don't hold back. Sing in unity. Because that's what the King of kings and Lord of lords is looking from all of us. They lead this worship. And then we get to the worshipers. So that's these four special angels, the choir of heaven that's leading. And then we get to the worshipers, the last part of this chapter. And there's 24 elders that are sitting on these thrones. When I think of that picture, I think back to my roots as a kid growing up in church. Do you remember, some of you are old enough to remember this. Some of you have seen pictures where they used to have on the stage these big, huge, massive, like, throne chairs for the pastor. Do you remember that? And then next to it was a smaller one for the associate minister because, you know, he doesn't deserve the big chair. He's got he's to sit in the small. Maybe they have one for the choir director. And they would have these thrones that the minister would sit on. And then when the senior minister got up to talk, oh, my goodness, everybody listen up. These 24 elders are not like that. They have the chairs. They have these crowns on their head. We'll get to that in a minute. But they're not interested in sitting on a throne to be recognized. The moment these cherubim start a worship course, they're falling on their knees and dropping their crowns and worshiping with all their might. And notice their worship's different than the angels. The angels talk about God because they don't have the personal experience that we do. Humans who've been saved by the blood of Jesus, who know and have tasted what sin is and the disgust that it brings to our life and the consequences that we suffer because of it. And then <laughs> to receive the salvation of God, we just want to sing to Jesus. We just want to honor him and tell him, Jesus, I love you so much. Oh my Goodness, you're worthy, Jesus. We just talk to him in second person. Why? Because we have a relationship with him. And that's the picture that John sees. John sees the sanctuary, sees choir. He sees all these incredible worshipers that are crying out, You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy. And I just got to believe that John just didn't observe it. He was on his knees with them. In his heart, he was falling before them too, wanting to give the crowns that he has. What is the crowns? I got some notes for you. These are not in your notes today. You can write these verses down, look them up later. If you want to do that, grab a pen real quick and just listen, or you can watch this online later and get back to it. Five descriptions of crowns in the scriptures that could be some of the crowns that we offer God in heaven. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about the crown of witness. That when you speak about Jesus to somebody around you, when you share the goodness of Christ and offer them the salvation, when you share the gospel with them, God says you get a crown as a part of that. 
Not that you converted them because you don't convert anybody. They have to come to Jesus just like you did. But your witness is honored by God. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, there's a crown of righteousness. Righteousness, Get this. God notices when you do things his way. The world may not care. The world might even try to convince you not to. But God notices your acts of righteousness. Those of you that participated in Love Our Neighbor last week, it's not that love our neighbor deserve, deserves or earns a crown. It's the fact that you acted in righteous obedience to what he told you to do. He recognizes that and honors that with a crown in heaven. Third one is the one that we talk about in Revelation. It's also in James chapter one, the crown of life. We don't earn eternity. Come on. You, you don't, you're not saved by your own works. You're saved by the blood of Jesus. Can I get an amen on that? When you give your life to Christ, he not only gives you his Holy Spirit on earth, he gives you a crown of life for eternity. And then when you get to heaven, you're just like ready to give it right back to him. Thank you, Jesus, for even letting me be here. Fourth one is the crown of morality. I think we all need to hear this one. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Those who live in purity and self-control will be crowned with his goodness. See, I know the world tries to convince us that we don't need to obey. We don't need to do it. We don't need to be pure. We don't need to have self-control. We don't need to live in morality. The laws have changed. The world has changed. We don't have to live that way. That is not how God sees it. He honors our attempts and our efforts to live in purity. So yes, you may get away with it on earth, but you will not receive a crown for it in heaven. And then finally, 1 Peter 5. This one throws me a little bit. 1 Peter 5 says you get a crown of glory. And I'm like, wait a second, time out here. There, there is nothing in my life worthy of glory. There is nothing we will ever do that should... In fact, I was taught in Bible college, you do never touch the glory of God. Because anybody who ever tried to was like Uzzah who touched the ark and was immediately killed. And that's not what, that's not what Peter's describing. What Peter's saying is, guess what? You're children of the Most High God. You're sons and daughters of the King. Can I get a hallelujah? You aren't earning Gloria, glory. God gives you his glory as part of his family. And you'll take that crown and turn it right back over to him. Because all glory goes to him. See, this scene had to be just beyond imagination and nearly impossible for John to describe to all of us. But he gives you a picture. Incredible example of what worship looks like. And I don't want you to miss the most important piece. Not sanctuary, not, not the choir of angels around him, not, not the rainbow, not the jasmine and carnalin and all that. Not, not even really the crowns and the 24 elders. I don't want you to miss it, but the only and most important piece of what John sees is who's in the center. Behold him. Look, all attention is focused on him. Is all your attention focused on him. Years ago when Diane and I were in Ohio, we served, supported the youth ministry, did stuff with them, went to their summer camps. They were going to CIY, Christ in Youth at the time. One year, Diana went. I didn't get the chance to go the first part of the week because 
I had a business thing that was going on and I had to stay back for the first two days. So on Wednesday, I drove, I think it was up in Michigan, drove up to Michigan to see the remainder of the week with our students. And when I walked in the building on Wednesday night for the worship session, it was 2,000 students in this auditorium, just packed into this place. And they're singing and celebrating and worshiping. You know, when teenagers worship, it's almost like aerobics, just trying to keep up with them. But then they get to this song, the song you just sang earlier. We fall down, we lay our crowns. And as soon as they started the song, as soon as they started the song, 2,000 students all hit the ground on their knees, shoving themselves in between the theater seating that was so tiny and small, getting themselves as low as they could and raising their hands in worship and singing with all their might. And I looked at it, I just started weeping. I was like, holy smokes, it's Revelation 4. I'm witnessing a taste of what it's going to be like before God someday. Those teens taught me something. Friends, when you come to worship, you're entering the presence. It's not about a building. It's not about the place. It's not even about the people. It's really about the one. He is worthy. He is holy. And we fall down and lay our crowns before him because that's all we've got to give him. So I want to sing that song again with you. Just because I'm so moved by it. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of His mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. Behold the king. It's his presence that makes our worship powerful. Incredible story. God, thank you so much for just a glimpse. I can't do it justice. It's far greater than I can even imagine. But thank you for your presence that you put inside of us, that you put around us, that will stand before us. And we cry, holy, holy, holy is your name. All glory and honor to you. Accept our feeble worship because your name deserves it. Thank you. In Jesus' name, and everybody agreed and said,